A Storm of Swords, Chapter 37, Jamie. Harren Hall's bathhouse was a dim, steamy, low-ceilinged room filled with great stone tubs. When they led Jamie in, they found Brienne seated in one of them, scrubbing her arm almost angrily. Not so hard, wench, he called. You'll scrub the skin off. She dropped her brush and covered her teats with hands as big as Gregor Clegane's. The pointy little buds she was so intent on hiding would have looked more natural on some ten-year-old than they did on her thick, muscular chest. "'What are you doing here?' she demanded. "'Lord Bolton insists I sup with him, but he neglected to invite my fleas.' Jamie tugged at his guard with his left hand. "'Help me out of these stinking rags.' One-handed, he could not so much as unlace his breeches. The man obeyed grudgingly, but he obeyed. "'Now leave us.' Jamie said when his clothes lay in a pile on the wet stone floor. My Lady of Tarth doesn't want the likes of you, scum, gaping at her teats. He pointed his stump at the hatchet-faced woman attending Brienne. You two, wait without. There's only the one door, and the wench is too big to try and shinny up a chimney. The habit of obedience went deep. The woman followed his guard out, leaving the bathhouse to the two of them. The tubs were large enough to hold six or seven after the fashion of the free cities, so Jamie climbed in with the wench, awkward and slow. Both his eyes were open, though the right remained somewhat swollen despite Kyburn's leeches. Jamie felt a hundred and nine years old, which was a deal better than he'd been feeling when he came to Harrenhal. Brienne shrunk away from him. There are other tubs. This one suits me well enough. Gingerly, he immersed himself up to the chin in the steaming water. Have no fear, wench. Your thighs are purple and green, and I'm not interested in what you've got between them. He had to rest his right arm on the rim, since Kyburn had warned him to keep the linen dry. He could feel the tension drain from his legs, but his head spun. If I faint, pull me out. No Lannister has ever drowned in his bath, and I don't mean to be the first. Why should I care how you die? You swore a solemn vow. He smiled as a red flush crept up the thick white column of her neck. She turned her back to him. Still the shy maiden. What is it that you think I haven't seen? He groped for the brush she had dropped, caught it with his fingers, and began to scrub himself desultorily. Even that was difficult. Awkward. My left hand is good for nothing. Still, the water darkened as the caked dirt dissolved off his skin. The wench kept her back to him, the muscles in her great shoulders hunched and hard. Does the sight of my stump distress you so? Jamie asked. You want to be pleased. I've lost the hand I killed the king with. The hand that flung the Stark boy from that tower? The hand I'd slide between my sister's thighs to make her wet. He thrust his stump at her face. No wonder Renly died with you guarding him. She jerked to her feet as if he'd struck her, sending a wash of hot water across the tub. Jamie caught a glimpse of the thick blonde bush at the juncture of her thighs as she climbed out. She was much hairier than his sister. Absurdly, he felt his cock stir beneath the bathwater. Now I know I have been too long away from Cersei. He averted his eyes, troubled by his body's response. That was unworthy, he mumbled. I'm a maimed man and bitter. Forgive me, wench. You protected me as well as any man could have, and better than most. She wrapped her nakedness in a towel. Do you mock me? That pricked him back to anger. Are you as thick as a castle wall? That was an apology. I I'm tired of fighting with you. What say we make a truce? Truces are built on trust. Would you have me trust the King Slayer? Yes, the oath breaker who murdered poor, sad Aerys Targaryen. Jamie snorted. It's not Aerys I rue, it's Robert. I hear they've named you King Slayer, he said to me at his coronation feast. Just don't think to make it a habit. And he laughed. Why is it that no one names Robert Oathbreaker? He tore the realm apart, yet I'm the one with shit for honor. Robert did all he did for love. Water ran down Brienne's legs and pooled beneath her feet. Robert did all he did for pride, a cunt, and a pretty face. He made a fist, or would have, if he'd had a hand. Pain lanced up his arm, cruel as laughter. He wrote to save the realm, she insisted. To save the realm? Did you know that my brother set the Blackwater rush afire? Wildfire will burn on water. Ares would have bathed in the stuff if he'd dared. The Targaryens were all mad for fire. Jamie felt lightheaded. It is the heat in here, the poison in my blood, the last of my fever. I am not myself. He eased himself down until the water reached his chin. Soiled my white cloak. I wore my gold armor that day, but... Gold armor? Her voice sounded far off, faint. 
He floated in heat in memory. After Dancing Griffins lost the Battle of the Bells, Ares exiled him. Why am I telling this absurd, ugly child? He had finally realized that Robert was no mere outlaw lord to be crushed at whim, but the greatest threat House Targaryen had faced since Daemon Blackfire. The king reminded Lewin Martell gracelessly that he held Elia, and sent him to take command of the 10,000 Dornishmen coming up the king's road. Gone, Derry, and Barristan Selmy rode to Stony Sept to rally what they could of Griffin's men, and Prince Rhaegar returned from the south and persuaded his father to swallow his pride and summon my father. But no raven returned from Casterly Rock, and that made the king even more afraid. He saw traitors everywhere, and Varys was always there to point out any he might have missed. So his grace commanded his alchemists to place caches of wildfire all over King's Landing, beneath Baylor's Sept and the hovels of Flea Bottom, under stables and storehouses at all seven gates, even in the cellars of the Red Keep itself. Everything was done in the utmost secrecy by a handful of master pyromancers. They didn't even trust their own acolytes to help. The Queen's eyes had been closed for years, and Rhaegar was busy marshalling an army. But Ares's new Mason Daggerhand was not utterly stupid, and with Rossert, Bellus, and Garrigus coming and going night and day, he became suspicious. Chelsted, that was his name. Lord Chelsted. It had come back to him suddenly in the telling. I thought the man craven, but uh, the day he confronted Ares, he found some courage somewhere. He did all he could to dissuade him. He reasoned, he jested, he threatened, and finally he begged. When that failed, he took off his chain of office and flung it down on the floor. Ares burnt him alive for that, and hung his chain about the neck of Rossert, his favorite pyromancer, the man who had cooked Lord Rickard Stark in his own armor. And all the time I stood by the foot of the Iron Throne in my white plate, still as a corpse, guarding my liege and all his sweet secrets. My sworn brothers were all away, you see, but Eris liked to keep me close. I was my father's son, so he didn't trust me. He watched me where Varys could watch me day and night. So I heard it all. He remembered how Rossert's eyes would shine when he unrolled his maps to show where the substance must be placed. Garrigus and Bellis were the same. Rhaegar met Robert on the Trident, and you know what happened there. When the word reached court, Eris packed the Queen off to Dragonstone with Prince Viserys. Princess Elia would have gone as well, but he forbade it. Somehow he got it in his head that Prince Lewin must have betrayed Rhaegar and the Trident. But he thought he could keep Dorne loyal so long as he kept Elliot and Aegon by his side. The traitors want my city, I heard him tell Rossert, but I'll give them naught but ashes. Let Robert be king over charred bones and cooked meat. The Targaryens never bury their dead, they burn them. Ares meant to have the greatest funeral pyre of them all. Though, if truth be told, I do not believe he truly expected to die. Like Arian Brightfire before him, Ares thought the fire would transform him, that he would rise again, reborn as a dragon, and turn all his enemies to ash. Ned Stark was racing south with Robert's van, but my father's forces reached the city first. Pycelle convinced the king that his Warden of the West had come to defend him, so he opened the gates. The one time he should have heeded Varys, and he ignored him. My father had held back from the war, brooding on all the wrongs Ares had done him, and determined that House Lannister should be on the winning side. The Trident decided him. It fell to me to hold the Red Keep, but I knew we were lost. I sent to Ares, asking his leave to make terms. My man came back with a royal command. Bring me your father's head if you are no traitor. Ares would have no yielding. Lord Rosert was with him, my messenger said. I knew what that meant. When I came on Rossert, he was dressed as a common man-at-arms, hurrying to a postern gate. I slew him first. Then I slew Eris before he could find someone else to carry his message to the pyromancers. Days later, I hunted down the others and slew them as well. Bellis offered me gold, and Garrigus wept for mercy. Well, the sword's more merciful than fire, but I don't think Garrigus much appreciated the kindness I showed him. The water had grown cool. When Jamie opened his eyes, he found himself staring at the stump of his sword hand. The hand that made me Kingslayer. The goat had robbed him of his glory and his shame, both at once. Leaving what? Who am I now? The wench looked ridiculous, clutching her towel to her meager teats with her thick white legs sticking out beneath. Has my tail turned you speechless? Come, curse me or kiss me or call me a liar. Something. If this is true, how is it no one knows? 
The Knights of the Kingsguard are sworn to keep the king's secrets. Would you have me break my oath? Jamie laughed. Do you think the noble Lord of Winterfell wanted to hear my feeble explanations? Such an honorable man. He only had to look at me to judge me guilty. Jamie lurched to his feet, the water running cold down his chest. By what right does the wolf judge the lion? By what right? A violent shiver took him, and he smashed his stump against the rim of the tub as he tried to climb out. Pain shuddered through him, and suddenly the bathhouse was spinning. Brienne caught him before he could fall. Her arm was all goose flesh, clammy and chilled, but she was strong and gentler than he would have thought. Gentler than Cersei, he thought as she helped him from the tub, his legs wobbly as a limp cock. Guards! He heard the wench shout. The Kingslayer! Jamie, he thought. My name is Jamie. The next he knew, he was lying on the damp floor with the guards and the wench and Kyburn all standing over him looking concerned. Brienne was naked, but she seemed to have forgotten that for the moment. The heat of the tubs will do it, Maester Kyburn was telling them. No, he's not a maester. They took his chain. They are still poison in his blood as well, and he's malnourished. What have you been feeding him? Worms and piss and grey vomit, offered Jamie. Hard bread and water and oat porridge, insisted the guard. He don't hardly eat it, though. What should we do with him? Scrub him and dress him and carry him to King's Pyre if need be, Kyburn said. Lord Bolton insists he will sup with him tonight. The time is growing short. Bring me clean garb for him, Brienne said. I'll see that he's washed and dressed. The others were all too glad to give her the task. They lifted him to his feet and sat him on a stone bench by the wall. Brienne went away to retrieve her towel and returned with a stiff brush to finish scrubbing him. Brienne went away to retrieve her towel and returned with a stiff brush to finish scrubbing him. One of the guards gave her a razor to trim his beard. Kyburn returned with rough-spun small clothes, clean black woolen breeches, a loose green tunic, and a leather jerkin that laced up the front. Jamie was feeling less dizzy by then, though no less clumsy. With the wench's help, he managed to dress himself. Now all I need is a silver looking glass. The bloody maester had brought fresh clothing for Brienne as well. I'm sorry, my lady. These were the only women's garments in Harrenhal large enough to fit you. It was obvious at once that the gown had been cut for someone with slimmer arms, shorter legs, and much fuller breasts. The fine mirish lace did little to conceal the bruising that mottled Brienne's skin. All in all, the guard made the wench look ridiculous. She has thicker shoulders than I do, and a bigger neck, Jamie thought. Small wonder she prefers to dress in male. Pink was not a kind color for her either. A dozen cruel japes leaped into his head, but for once he kept them there. Best not to make her angry. He was no match for her one-handed. Kyburn had brought a flask as well. What is it? Jamie demanded when the chainless maester pressed him to drink. Licorice steeped in vinegar with honey and cloves. It'll give you some strength and clear your head. Bring me the potion that grows new hands, said Jamie. That's the one I want. Drink it, Brienne said, unsmiling, and he did. It was half an hour before he felt strong enough to stand. After the dim, wet warmth of the bathhouse, the air outside was a slap across the face. My lord will be looking for him by now, a guard told Kyburn. Her too. Do I need to carry him? I can still walk. Brienne, give me your arm. Clutching her, Jamie let them herd him across the yard to a vast, drafty hall, larger even than the throne room in King's Landing. Huge hearths lined the walls, one every ten feet or so, more than he could count, but no fires had been lit, so the chill between the walls went bone deep. A dozen spearmen in fur cloaks guarded the doors and the steps that led up to the two galleries above. And in the center of that immense emptiness, at a trestle table surrounded by what seemed like acres of smooth slate floor, the lord of the Dreadfort waited, attended only by a cupbearer. My lord, said Brienne when they stood before him. Roose Bolton's eyes were paler than stone, darker than milk, and his voice was spider-soft. I am pleased that you are strong enough to attend me, sir. My lady, do be seated. He gestured at the spread of cheese, bread, cold meat, and fruit that covered the table. Will you drink red or white? Of indifferent vintage, I fear. Sir Amory drained Lady Wentz's cellars nearly dry. I trust you killed him for it. Jamie slid into the offered seat quickly so Bolton could not see how weak he was. Why does for Starks? I'll drink red like a good Lannister. I would prefer water, said Brienne. 
Elmer the Red for Sir Jamie, Water for the Lady Brienne, and Hippocras for myself. Bolton waved a hand at their escort, dismissing them, and the men beat a silent retreat. Habit made Jamie reach for his wine with his right hand. His stump rocked the goblet, spattering his clean linen bandages with bright red spots, and forcing him to catch the cup with his left hand before it fell, but Bolton pretended not to notice his clumsiness. The Northman helped himself to a prune and ate it with small, sharp bites. Do try these, Sir Jamie. They are most sweet and help move the bowels as well. Lord Vargo took them from an inn before he burnt it. My bowels move fine, that goat's no lord, and your prunes don't interest me half so much as your intentions. Regarding you? A faint smile touched Roose Bolton's lips. You are a perilous prize, sir. You sow dissension wherever you go, even here in my happy house of Harrenhal. His voice was a whisker above a whisper. And in River Run as well, it seems. Do you know Edmir Tully has offered a thousand golden dragons for your recapture? Is that all? My sister will pay ten times as much. Will she? That smile again, there for an instant, gone as quick. Ten thousand dragons is a formidable sum. Of course, there is Lord Karstark's offer to consider as well. He promises the hand of his daughter to the man who brings him your head. Leave it to your goat to get it backward, said Jamie. Bolton gave a soft chuckle. Harry and Karstark was captive here when we took the castle, did you know? I gave him all the Carhold men still with me, and sent him off to Glover. I do hope nothing ill befell him at Duskendale, else Alice Karstark would be all that remains of Lord Rickard's progeny. He chose another prune. Fortunately for you, I have no need of a wife. I wed the Lady Walda Frey whilst I was at the Twins. Fair Walda? Awkwardly, Jamie tried to hold the bread with his stump while tearing it with his left hand. Fat Walda. My Lord of Frey offered me my bride's weight in silver for a dowry, so I chose accordingly. Elmer, break off some bread for Sir Jamie. The boy tore a fist-sized chunk off one end of the loaf and handed it to Jamie. Brienne tore her own bread. Lord Bolton, she asked. It said you mean to give Harrenhal to Vargo Hote. That was his price, Lord Bolton said. The Lannisters are not the only men who pay their debts. I must take my leave soon in any case. Edmir Tully is to wed the Lady Rosalind Frey at the Twins, and my king commands my attendants. Edmir weds, said Jamie. Not Rob Stark? His Grace King Rob is wed. Bolton spit a prune pit into his hand and put it aside. To a westerling of the crag, I am told her name is Jane. No doubt you know her, sir. Her father is your father's bannerman. My father has a good many bannermen, and most of them have daughters. Jamie groped one-handed for his goblet, trying to recall this Jane. The westerlings were an old house with more pride than power. That cannot be true, Brienne said stubbornly. King Rob was sworn to wed a fray. He would never break faith, he— His grace is a boy of sixteen, said Roose Bolton mildly. And I would thank you not to question my word, my lady. Jamie felt almost sorry for Rob Stark. He won the war on the battlefield and lost it in a bedchamber, poor fool. How does Lord Walder relish dining on trout in place of wolf? he asked. Oh, trout makes for a tasty supper. Bolton lifted a pale finger toward his cupbearer. Though my poor Elmer is bereft. He was to wed Arya Stark, but my good father of Frey had no choice but to break the betrothal when King Rob betrayed him. Is there word of Arya Stark? Brienne leaned forward. Lady Catelyn had feared that... Is the girl still alive? Oh, yes, said the Lord of the Dreadfort. You have certain knowledge of that, my lord? Roose Bolton shrugged. Arya Stark was lost for a time, it was true, but now she has been found. I mean to see her return safely to the north. Her and her sister both, said Brienne. Tyrion Lannister has promised us both girls for his brother. That seemed to amuse the Lord of the Dreadfort. My lady, has no one told you? Lannisters lie. Is that a slight on the honor of my house? Jamie picked up the cheese knife with his good hand. A rounded point and dull, he said, sliding his thumb along the edge of the blade but it'll go through your eye all the same. Sweat beaded his brow. He could only hope he did not look as feeble as he felt. Lord Bolton's little smile paid another visit to his lips. 
You speak boldly for a man who needs help to break his bread. My guards are all around us, I remind you. All around us and half a league away. Jamie glanced down the vast length of the hall. By the time they reach us, you'll be as dead as Eris. Tis scarcely chivalrous to threaten your host over his own cheese and olives, the Lord of the Dreadfort scolded. In the North, we hold the laws of hospitality sacred still. I'm a captive here, not a guest. Your gout cut off my hand. If you think some prunes will make me overlook that, you're bloody well mistaken. That took Roose Bolton aback. Perhaps I am. Perhaps I ought to make a wedding gift of you to Edmure Tully, or strike your head off as your sister did for Eddard Stark. I would not advise it. Casterly Rock has a long memory. A thousand leagues of mountain, sea, and bog lie between my walls and your rock. Lannister enmity means little to Bolton. Lannister friendship could mean much. Jamie thought he knew the game they were playing now. But does the wench know as well? He dare not look to see. I am not certain you are the sort of friends a wise man would want. Bruce Bolton beckoned to the boy. Elmer, carve our guests a slice off the roast. Brienne was served first, but made no move to eat. My lord, she said, Sir Jamie is to be exchanged for Lady Catelyn's daughters. You must free us to continue on our way. The raven that came from River Run told of an escape, not an exchange. And if you helped this captive slip his bonds, you are guilty of treason, my lady. The big wench rose to her feet. I serve Lady Stark. And I, the king in the north. Or the king who lost the north, as some now call him. Who never wished to trade Sir Jamie back to the Lannisters. Sit down and eat, Brienne, Jamie urged as Elmer placed a slice of roast before him, dark and bloody. If Bolton meant to kill us, he wouldn't be wasting his precious prunes on us at such peril to his bowels. He stared at the meat and realized there was no way to cut it one-handed. I am worth less than a girl now, he thought. The goats even the trade, though I doubt Lady Catelyn will thank him when Cersei returns her whelps in like condition. The thought made him grimace. I will get the blame for that as well, I'd wager. Roose Bolton cut his meat methodically, the blood running across his plate. Lady Brienne, will you sit if I tell you that I hope to send Sir Jamie on, just as you and Lady Stark desire? I... you'd send us on? The wench sounded wary, but she sat. That is good, my lord. It is. However, Lord Vargo has created me one small... difficulty. He turned his pale eyes on Jamie. Do you know why Hote cut off your hand? He enjoys cutting off hands? The linen that covered Jamie's stump was spotted with blood and wine. He enjoys cutting off feet as well. He doesn't seem to need a reason. Nonetheless, he had one. Hote is more cunning than he appears. No man commands a company such as the Brave Companions for long unless he has some wits about him. Bolton stabbed a chunk of meat with the point of his dagger, put it in his mouth, chewed thoughtfully, swallowed. Lord Vargo abandoned House Lannister because I offered him Harrenhal, a reward a thousand times greater than any he could hope to have from Lord Tywin. As a stranger to Westeros, he did not know the prize was poisoned. The curse of Harren the Black? mocked Jaime. The curse of Tywin Lannister. Bolton held out his goblet and Elmer refilled it silently. Our goat should have consulted the Tarbex or the Reigns. They might have warned him how your lord father deals with betrayal. There are no Tarbex or Reigns, said Jamie. My point precisely. Lord Vargo doubtless hoped that Lord Stannis would triumph at King's Landing, and thence confirm him in his possession of this castle in gratitude for his small part in the downfall of House Lannister. He gave a dry chuckle. He knows little of Stannis Baratheon either, I fear. That one might have given him Harrenhal for his service, but he would have given him a noose for his crimes as well. A noose is kinder than what he'll get from my father. By now he has come to the same realization. With Stannis broken and Renly dead, only a stark victory can save him from Lord Tywin's vengeance. But the chances of that grow perishingly slim. King Rob has won every battle, Brienne said stoutly, as stubbornly loyal of speech as she was of deed. Won every battle while losing the phrase, the Karstarks, Winterfell, and the North. A pity the wolf is so young. Boys of sixteen always believe they are immortal and invincible. An older man would bend the knee, I'd think. After a war there is always a peace, and with peace there are pardons. 
For the Rob Starks, at least. Not for the likes of Vargo Hoat. Bolton gave him a small smile. Both sides have made use of him, but neither will shed a tear at his passing. The brave companions did not fight in the Battle of the Blackwater, yet they died there all the same. You'll forgive me if I don't mourn. You have no pity for our wretched, doomed goat. Ah, but the gods must. Else why deliver you into his hands? Bolton chewed another chunk of meat. Carhold is smaller and meaner than Harrenhal, but it lies well beyond the reach of the lion's claws. Once wed to Alice Carstark, Hote might be a lord in truth. If he could collect some gold from your father, so much the better, but he would have delivered you to Lord Rickard no matter how much Lord Tywin paid. His price would be the maid, and safe refuge. But to sell you, he must keep you, and the Riverlands are full of those who would gladly steal you away. Glover and Tallheart were broken at Duskendale, but remnants of their host are still abroad, with the mountains slaughtering the stragglers. A thousand Karstarks prowl the land south and east of Riverrun, hunting you. Elsewhere are dairymen left lordless and lawless, packs of four-footed wolves and the Lightning Lord's outlaw bands. Dundarian would gladly hang you and the goat together from the same tree. The Lord of the Dreadfort sopped up some of the blood with a chunk of bread. Harrenhal was the only place Lord Vargo could hope to hold you safe, but here his brave companions are much outnumbered by my own men, and by Sir Aenys and his phrase. No doubt he feared I might return you to Sir Edmure at Riverrun, or worse, send you on to your father. By maiming you, he meant to remove your sword as a threat, gain himself a grisly token to send to your father, and diminish your value to me. For he is my man, as I am King Rob's man, Thus his crime is mine, or may seem so in your father's eyes. And therein lies my small difficulty. He gazed at Jamie, his pale eyes unblinking, expectant, chill. I see. You want me to absolve you of blame, to tell my father that this stump is no work of yours? Jamie laughed. My lord, send me to Circe and I'll sing as sweet a song as you could want of how gently you treated me. Any other answer he knew and Bolton would give him back to the goat. Had I a hand, I'd write it out. How I was maimed by the sellsword my own father brought to Westeros, and saved by the noble Lord Bolton. I will trust to your word, sir. There's something I don't often hear. How soon might we be permitted to leave? And how do you mean to get me past all these wolves and brigands and Karstarks? You will leave when Kyburn says you are strong enough, with a strong escort of picked men under the command of my captain, Walton. Steelshanks, he is called. A soldier of iron loyalty. Walton will see you safe and whole to King's Landing. Provided Lady Catelyn's daughters are delivered safe and whole as well, said the wench. My lord, your man Walton's protection is welcome, but the girls are my charge. The lord of the Dreadfort gave her an uninterested glance. The girls need not concern you any further, my lady. The Lady Sansa is the dwarf's wife. Only the gods can part them now. His wife? Brienne said, appalled. The imp? But he swore before the whole court in sight of gods and men. She is such an innocent. Jamie was almost as surprised, if truth be told, but he hid it better. Sansa Stark. That ought to put a smile on Tyrion's face. He remembered how happy his brother had been with his little crofter's daughter. For a fortnight. What the imp did or did not swear scarcely matters now, said Lord Bolton. Least of all to you. The wench looked almost wounded. Perhaps she finally felt the steel jaws of the trap when Roose Bolton beckoned to his guards. Sir Jamie will continue on to King's Landing. I said nothing about you, I fear. It would be unconscionable of me to deprive Lord Vargo of both his prizes. The Lord of the Dreadfort reached out to pick another prune. Were I you, my lady, I should worry less about Starks and rather more about Sapphires.' 